Hello, uh, today we are going to do a worked example. Uh, we have uh, looked at uh, uh, diffraction, we have looked at reciprocal space. So uh, many of those concepts uh, we are now beginning to become familiar with. So we are going to look at a worked example uh, which relates uh, you know some of the theory that we have discussed uh, with something that you may actually uh, do experimentally which is to obtain diffraction patterns and then try to analyze those diffraction patterns. So that is something that we as materials uh, scientists we do quite often uh, in the lab and one of the tools that we use uh, uh, quite regularly these days is the electron microscope. So we are going to see how what we have calculated uh, relates to a diffraction pattern that you would obtain off of a uh, electron microscope. So in fact we are going to actually uh, generate a diffraction pattern and if you actually had a sample it would generate a pattern similar to what uh, we are going to put on the board. Okay, so that is the activity that we are going to do. So I will put down something like a question, then we will look at various aspects of the question and uh, in the end as we finish off we will have a pattern which is the diffraction pattern that corresponds to that question. So let us put down the question first. Okay, so the question is this, we want to generate uh, an electron diffraction pattern, an electron diffraction pattern in this case a spot pattern because we will assume it is a single crystal. We want to generate an electron diffraction pattern for an FCC crystal for the zone axis 0, 1 bar 0. Okay, so there are lot of things that are specified here which maybe you may not have been familiar with uh, uh, or to some degree you may have familiarity with. Uh, so I will walk you through some of the terms and then uh, we will uh, uh, actually do the uh, pattern calculation and then uh, yeah, so we will uh, go about it. So the first thing I want to point out is this term, uh, uh, so there are a lot of things here. First is that we were, I am talking of electron diffraction pattern, so there is some reason why I am indicating that. Uh, I am talking of a FCC which, which means face centered cubic crystal, so that also has uh, some significance in the context of the question. And the third thing that is of uh, uh, importance is this uh, concept that it is along a particular zone axis. So uh, the uh, issue is this, when you take a single crystal and you obtain a diffraction pattern from it, that pattern is going to differ based on how the crystal is oriented with respect to the radiation that is incident on it. Okay, so that is why the zone axis comes into being. Okay. And uh, the diffraction pattern that you get will also depend on the uh, uh, manner in which the diffraction pattern interacts with the uh, crystal and that is why I have spoken about electron diffraction so that I will uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, indicate. And uh, the fact that it is a face centered cubic crystal also puts some additional uh, specific, uh, specifications on it. So first let us start with something called the zone axis. So you may already be familiar with it, I will just very briefly show you uh, what we are referring to when we say zone axis. So basically we simply say that supposing you have a plane. So I will just draw a plane, and let us say another plane intersects it. So naturally when two planes intersect, if they are not parallel they are going to intersect at some point and they will intersect along some line. So I will put that line down here and we will just say that this is another plane. Okay, so So we now have two planes which are intersecting each other and they intersect along this line. Okay. So now uh, as you can uh, uh, imagine when you have a line that is on a plane then the normal to that plane is going to be normal to that line. So anything that is perpendicular to this plane will automatically be perpendicular to any line on that plane because that is how the plane is defined. You have a plane does not matter in which direction you draw lines on that plane, if you have a normal that normal will be normal to any of those lines, right. So this line lies on this plane, it also lies on the other plane. So on both the planes this, this is a common line. So therefore this line is perpendicular 
so if it, if I draw the perpendicular to this plane, it is roughly in this direction. Okay, so that is perpendicular to this plane here. This uh, uh, normal that I have drawn here, that is also going to be perpendicular to this uh, common line. Similarly, if I take this plane here, the uh, normal to it will be some in in this direction. And that uh, naturally will also be perpendicular to this line because this line is common to this plane as well as this plane. Okay, so therefore, when you have two planes intersecting, uh, the uh, uh, line of intersection is uh, perpendicular to the normal to of uh, each of those planes, right? So uh, this line, this common line, is then referred to as the zone axis. Uh, and uh, uh, you can actually have multiple planes. You can have a series of planes which go through this line. So you can have several planes going through this uh, line, uh, common line. Uh, or at least you can find such planes which are all going through this uh, common line and for all of those planes this common line is referred to as the zone axis and in uh, inverse uh, way of saying it all those planes are said to belong to this zone they are planes of this zone okay so it is a direction it's a line in uh, in a crystal lattice so you can specify it as you know uh, saying uvw you will say you will specify a line in uh, in the crystal axis as uvw So that is how it will end up coming and uh, uh, it is a specific line, so you have uh, square brackets here. So uh, therefore, uh, you will find that uh, when you specify this, you can say you can look at all the planes that uh, are uh, perpendicular to it and uh, they will uh, belong to this particular zone. So that is this uh, UVW that we are referring to here in this particular question as 0, 1 bar 0. Okay, so this is uh, the zone axis uh, that is there. Uh, now, why we have picked the zone axis is something we are going to look at in a moment, but at the moment this is what we are referring to as zone axis. I have just indicated to you two planes and I have shown you the uh, normal to it. Now, um, we will okay, we will, we will keep this picture in mind, we will come back to this in just a moment. What I am going to now draw is just a set of points which would then represent uh, points in reciprocal space and I will also draw the evolved sphere. In this case, it is two dimensional, so an, uh, an evolved circle so to speak. Uh, which is the condition that we have uh, identified as our diffraction condition. So, let us just draw some points here. Okay, so I have a 4 by 4 grid. Okay, let, let me just put one more point, 5, 5 by 5 grid, let us just do it. So, let us say these are points in reciprocal space. They are points corresponding to a reciprocal lattice which corresponds to some real lattice. Let us not worry about which real lattice it is. It is these are valid reciprocal lattice points. So, we, we uh, discussed in our earlier classes that uh, so, we would designate something as the origin which would then be 0, 0, 0 and uh, if we have some radiation which is uh, interacting with this lattice, we would draw the uh, a vector which would have 1 by lambda as its magnitude, 1 over lambda as uh, uh, the magnitude and the direction would be it would, it would just contact this uh, 0, 0, 0 and then you would draw a circle with this as the center. So you would get a circle of this uh, nature and wherever it happens to touch a reciprocal lattice point, so for example in this diagram the way I have drawn it, it seems to ap appears to touch this reciprocal lattice point. So then uh, the condition for diffraction is satisfied for this uh, reciprocal lattice point with respect to this radiation in this crystal. So that is how we have uh, uh, seen it. So this is a large, uh, this is a circle that I have drawn. Now um, the point to remember is uh, one additional detail we will add here, uh, which is that uh, as I mentioned once before in one of our earlier classes, you, you have a choice here. You have a, a crystal which belongs to the sample. So naturally you can keep changing from sample to sample and therefore you can have different crystals corresponding to them a different array of points would appear here. You could also have independent of the sample, you can have different radiations incident on it. For each radiation, the wavelength would differ. Okay, so therefore, uh, you can actually independently vary the radius of this circle. 
or ra radius of the sphere, in this case a circle, appearing as a circle on two dimensions. You can independently uh, vary this uh, uh, sphere. And therefore, uh, for a given combination of uh, uh, crystal and wavelength of radiation in, uh, incident on it, specific set of points would satisfy the Bragg condition, would satisfy the diffraction condition, right. So, that set of points is going to vary as you change the wavelength. It is not the same regardless of the wavelength. So, it is going to come based on the uh, wavelength that you put on. So, that is one point that we need to keep in mind. But there is uh, there is sort of an extreme end of this uh, uh, picture of th this basic concept that I have shown you that you know you can have a small circle, you can have a larger circle, a even, even larger circle and so on uh, based on the wavelength. And it is sort of an inverse picture because the larger the wavelength this, uh, that you are putting incident on the uh, uh, sample, the smaller is its uh, reciprocal uh, uh, quantity. So, this 1 by lambda becomes smaller and smaller as you as your actual lambda goes up. The opposite happens as you keep decreasing the wavelength this uh, uh, radius keeps becoming larger and larger of the circle. So, it becomes larger and larger. Normally, for example, in X-ray diffraction, uh, you will have wavelengths of the order of say approximately in X XRD, X-ray diffraction, you will have wavelengths of the order of say 1.5 angstroms of that order. So, copper K alpha is roughly in this uh, 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 dimension, this kind of uh, quantity. The interplanar spacing is also of the order of 2 angstroms. Approximately 2 angstroms. If you go to electron diffraction, what happens is the wavelength that we use in electron diffraction So, this is lambda here, lambda is approximately 1.5 angstroms. Lambda is of the order of uh, something like 0 0.0, say 0 0.01 angstroms or 0 0.02 angstroms and so on, okay. So, um, so you, what happens is, so you see these numbers here, you have a 1.5 angstrom, you have a 2 angstrom and you have a 0 0.01 angstrom going to electron diffraction. I, I mentioned to you that these are uh, what you are plotting in reciprocal space is an inverted quantity. Right. So, if it is large in real space, it is small in reciprocal space. Uh, these two quantities are similar. In real space, you have 1.5 angstroms, you have 2 angstroms. They are a similar order of magnitude. So, you will see uh, you know a set of points here and uh, the spacing between these points which will be the inverse of this interplanar spacing, you are plotting the inverse of it. So, this is uh, say if it is 2 angstroms, uh, the interplanar spacing here uh, is this interplanar spacing in real space. Uh, in this uh, reciprocal space, it will be 0 0.5 angstrom inverse. So, that is what it is going to be, right? In reciprocal space, 1 over 2. So, that will be 0 0.5. So, I will just say that this is 0 0.5 angstroms inverse. So, that is uh, so that is the uh, dimension of this quantity in reciprocal space. The uh, uh, 1.5 angstroms would be uh, inverse. So, uh, that is actually going to be in uh, similar uh, order of magnitude here. So, if you do, so it will be a roughly about you know 0 0.6, 0 0.7 angstrom inverse. So, that is also of the same order of magnitude. So, you will have a radius of that, uh, of that order. So, 1 over 1.5. So, roughly, roughly ap approximately 0 0.67 angstrom uh, inverse. So, little larger than this 0.5, so something like that. So, so you see when you use X-ray diffraction, the uh, uh, radius of the uh, uh, the uh, evolved sphere that you generate is very similar in magnitude to the interplanar spacing that is present in the crystal. Okay, so so that creates a certain type of uh, set of interactions that are possible, and as you change the uh, uh, wavelength, you start seeing different uh, points in the uh, uh, different points satisfying the Bragg condition. However, when you go to electron diffraction you are using wavelengths that are two orders of magnitude different from the interplanar spacing, right. So, if you have a wavelength of 0 0.01 angstroms, the uh, when you do the uh, uh, incident uh, wave vector, this is the incident wave vector which is which has the magnitude 1 by lambda, that 1 by lambda that incident wave vector is now of the order of 100 angstrom inverse the modulus of your incident wave vector is of the order of 100 angstrom inverse. So, it means 
if you have only 0.5 here, so you have to go 200 spacings along this uh, uh, line, 200 spacings along this line before you can you know put the origin or the center of the sphere, right. So right now for example, I, I have you know I have put it at little over one, one and a half for this particular uh, you know wavelength you would get, for XRD you would see something like this. that is notionally okay uh, may not be an exact thing so that's the, that's the center here so that's the sphere with the center here corresponding to the wavelength 2 uh, 1.5 angstroms wavelength okay so that is for x ray diffraction this would be the center uh, and with respect to that you would have this uh, uh, wavelength some other wavelength which would be slightly smaller would have a little larger uh, uh, wave vector and would get generate that sphere that we originally drew what i'm telling you is that when you use electron diffraction uh, you are not going to go uh, the center is not going to be just uh, one or two uh, uh, reciprocal lattice uh, vector spacings. You have to go 200 times, 200 spacings along this uh, uh, line before you reach the center, okay. Uh, so you will have to go very far, very, very far on this board. So you probably will have to exceed this board well past this, uh, the length of this board before you reach the center of the uh, evolved sphere corresponding to the uh, wavelength of uh, 0.01 angstroms, okay. So, uh, but that does not change the condition for diffraction. The condition for diffraction is still the same. The condition of diffraction uh, for diffraction simply states that whenever the evolved sphere touches a reciprocal lattice point, diffraction will occur, right. So that condition of diffraction simply means that uh, you have to now generate the sphere corresponding to 100 angstrom inverse, okay, 100 angstrom inverse and wherever that happens to touch a reciprocal lattice point, you will see diffraction. As you can see here, so given this condition, as you can see here, when I go from a smaller radius to a larger radius, the curvature starts decreasing, right. So that is inversely related, curvature is inversely related to radius. The smaller the radius, the more curved it is, larger it becomes less and less curved. So if you go to larger and larger and larger radius, it almost starts becoming planar in the scale of this diagram, right. So a larger radius would, uh, would look something like that. So some larger radius. So these are the reciprocal lattice points, okay, so those are reciprocal lattice points here. So I have now drawn a part of a sphere which is larger in radius than even the one that I originally drew. So if you continue this, what normally happens is that when you go to electron diffraction kind of uh, uh, conditions where you have 100 angstrom uh, inverse as the uh, uh, you know uh, modulus of the wave vector that you are putting in the sphere corresponding to it in this in the scale of this diagram will almost look like a flat plane it's a huge sphere of which you are seeing only a small section and in in the scale of this diagram it looks like a flat uh, a flat line i mean it looks like a straight line or a plane in this uh, if you look at it in three dimensions it's simply the surface a small section of the surface of a very 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 large sphere in the scale of this diagram, okay, because you, you, the radius of this sphere is uh, you know 200 times the spacing away and therefore in this scale of this uh, image it looks like a flat and straight line. So that changes uh, or that brings in certain very interesting uh, uh, situations into this uh, analysis. The main thing that it brings in is the fact that these are all now in this, uh, these reciprocal lattice points that it intersects have a special property you can see that uh, corresponding to, so, so basically I am only going to draw a part of this uh, incident uh, beam uh, wave vector, so that is going to be something in like this and it continues, okay. So that is your incident beam vector, it just continues quite a bit, like I said 200 spacings that side, so I am only drawing part of it. Uh, here uh, this, wave, this uh, uh, wave vector, as you can see from the diagram that we have drawn, is perpendicular to this direction that you have here. It is actually basically perpendicular to this plane and of which we are only seeing a two dimensional section, so you are seeing a line. So therefore, uh, all of these vectors that you see here, this is one vector, this would be another vector,
these are all vectors that are going from the origin 0, 0, 0 to specific reciprocal lattice points. Okay. So, though all of those vectors are actually perpendicular to this uh, uh, vector that you see here. And this vector, this long vector is your incident beam vector. Okay. So, what do we observe? So, the, the main points that we observe are when you use electron diffraction, the uh, points that satisfy the diffraction condition appear to lie on a flat plane, appear to lie on a, a flat plane in the scale of this uh, diagram and uh, they are all uh, points that are perpendicular to this incident beam direction. Okay. So, and what are these points? They are reciprocal lattice vectors and what is the uh, 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 property of a reciprocal lattice vector? It is perpendicular to a plane in real space and the magnitude of it is the inverse of the magnitude of the interplanar spacing. Right? So, we wrote H H K L is perpendicular to H K L and modulus of H H K L equals 1 by D H K L. These are the things that we wrote which is going to hold true, does not matter what your, uh, what your lattice is etcetera. So, these are reciprocal lattice vectors, so therefore they are naturally perpendicular to those respective HKL planes and their magnitude is 1 by the spacing or 1 over the spacing of uh, the uh, uh, that particular HKL plane. Now, let us go back to our previous diagram, you see here uh, a perpendicular, you see another perpendicular, so you automatically see that these are uh, uh, these can naturally represent directions in reciprocal space, correct? Because they are perpendicular to respective planes. So, this is perpendicular to this plane, this is perpendicular to this plane that I have drawn here. Therefore, uh, they are uh, valid reciprocal lattice directions in the in reciprocal space and if the magnitude is uh, 1 over the spacing of the planes in this direction, then uh, that would be a vector uh, that would lead to a point in reciprocal lattice. But the interesting thing here is that they are all perpendicular to this line here, that is the zone axis. Okay. So, we have uh, reciprocal lattice vectors, uh, directions of reciprocal lattice vectors are uh, perpendicular to the zone axis. First, we independently drew this, we had two planes intersecting, we said that the line that intersects uh, that is common to them is the zone axis and we also noticed that the perpendiculars to each of those planes are naturally also perpendicular to the zone axis. Now, we also recognize the fact that these perpendiculars to those planes happen to be the directions in which the reciprocal lattice vectors would be for those particular planes. Therefore, we recognize that the reciprocal lattice vectors would be perpendicular to the zone axis. Right? Now, let us go back to this figure here. We have a series of reciprocal lattice vectors and they are all perpendicular to this one line. Therefore, this one line coincides with the zone axis corresponding to these planes. In other words, if I were to take this picture and go back to that picture here, uh, this is the beam direction, right? This uh, line that I am saying, this line is commonly perpendicular to all of these points, all the, all of these vectors. This is the beam direction, and these are reciprocal lattice vectors. So this image, if I move it to this picture here in real space, this is your beam direction. So that's the direction of the beam and uh, that coincides with the zone axis and then you have all the reciprocal lattice uh, vectors which are now perpendicular to it. They would now correspond to points which in the reciprocal space and that is how you would see it. So, therefore, uh, when you take electron diffraction, the pattern of points that you see represent points of a zone. They are all uh, vectors which uh, belong to that zone axis and the beam direction coincides with that zone axis. So, that is the important point that we wish to note. Okay? So, that is the uh, peculiar thing about electron diffraction and uh, how it uh, shows you the points that you see there which are spot spots, those are all spots corresponding to the same zone. Right? So, now let us go back to this problem we have here. So, we understand the significance of electron diffraction in the context of this question. We also understand the significance of the zone axis which means the this is the direction in which the beam is coming 0 1, uh, 1 bar 0 and corresponding to that. Uh, we have an, we also have an FCC crystal uh, for which in the 0, 1 bar 0 direction the beam is incident and corresponding to that we want to generate the uh, diffraction pattern. So, we will now do that there. Okay? So, we will now take the zone axis here again, zone axis is 0, 1 bar 0. 
Couple more concepts we will put in here which are very interesting. Uh, we also, I also mentioned here it is FCC. Okay. So, what I am actually going to do is actually I am going to generate the uh, uh, reciprocal lattice points corresponding to this zone axis actually for a simple cubic. Initially, I am going to do only for a simple cubic. Then I am going to put a condition which says that certain of those points corresponding to simple cubic are not allowed for face centered cubic. So, you remove those points what remains is the diffraction pattern of the face, uh, face centered cubic. These are called extinction rules. There are something called extinction rules simply because in a face centered uh, structure you have additional atoms at some locations which lead to uh, additional cancellations or uh, additional destructive interferences and therefore, uh, you will get a set of points if, it, if they were simple cubic, but some of those points get cancelled when you have face centered cubic. Another set of points get cancelled when you have body centered cubic uh, or body centered structure, body centered structure, face centered structure you have some cancellations going on additional cancellations. So, a simple uh, cubic structure in this case will give you the uh, super set of points that you can get and uh, uh, a subset of those points is what you will see in face centered cubic, another subset is what you will see in body centered cubic. Okay. So, so we will do it for simple cubic then we will eliminate or we will highlight those points which are now valid for uh, FCC. Specifically for FCC the condition that is that holds for a, a, a point uh, for diffraction to uh, be uh, displayed by a plane or a set of planes is that the h, the k and the l values should either be all odd or all even should be all odd or all even. In this context they then uh, they also you know instead of saying all odd or all even they simply say unmixed meaning either all odd or all even. So, a 2 2 2 plane can give uh, uh, diffraction, a 2 4 2 can give you diffraction, 2 4 0 can give you diffraction but a 2 4 1 cannot give you diffraction, uh, 1 0 1 cannot give you diffraction uh, things like that. Okay. So, uh, so that is the, that is the problem. In, in the case of simple cubic such restriction is not there. Any value of HKL potentially can give you a diffraction pattern. Okay. So, potentially can give you a diffraction pattern. So, when we do when we first draw the spot pattern we will draw for simple cubic we will not worry about the individual values of uh, HKL being unmixed odd or even. Then we will identify from that set only the ones that where HKL are either all odd or all even and for that we will uh, generate the that will then that subset is then the diffraction pattern for the face centered cubic structure. So, uh, this is the zone axis when something is a zone axis the planes that belong to this zone. Uh, so, zone axis we will designate as u v w the zone uh, so that is the zone axis any plane h k l belongs to this zone if h u plus k v plus l w equals 0. So, this we will not derive here, we will simply accept this, there are derivations for this available, you can look them, look it up, but this is straightforward uh, uh, relationship. So, if h u plus k v plus l w equals 0, then that h k l plane belongs to this zone okay? and therefore, it has uh, you know it has a line this uh, axis actually falls on that plane like you saw for those two planes uh, earlier. So, now if you look at our zone axis that we are considering for this problem, we have 0, 1 bar, 0. So, if I take any arbitrary HKL plane, what I am saying is uh, H, in, H times 0 is 0, uh, 0 minus k uh, plus 0 should equal 0. If I just do H u plus k v plus L w equals 0, so you have 0 minus k plus 0 equals 0. So, therefore, for this to be equal to 0, we simply are requiring that k should be equal to 0. Okay. So, all planes where k is equal to 0 belong to the uh, basically belong to this zone axis, I have this as the have this have this as the zone axis. Okay. So, I can write uh, all these uh, planes. So, therefore, quite simply you know if I have a, a 1 0 0 plane, it would belong to this zone axis or the zone uh, would belong to this zone and I could also have uh, 0 0 1 plane that would also belong to this uh, zone right. So, all of these would uh, belong to this zone. Now, uh, having uh, come so normally in reciprocal like in since it is a vectorial you know it is a set of points that can be obtained by vectorial addition 
it is sufficient if you obtain two points uh, with something as the origin and then you can the two closest points to the origin and from there you can uh, get all the other points simply by doing a vectorial addition which is what we are going to do. So, uh, but to do that uh, we need both the dimension we also need the uh, uh, angle between those two points. So, to get the angle when you have uh, h1, so this is h1 k1 l1, so this is one plane that belongs to this uh, zone for which that is the zone axis and this is h2 k2 l2. So, the angle between those planes is simply h1 h2 plus k1 k2 plus l1 l2 divided by square root of h1 square plus k1 square plus l1 square multiplied with square root of h2 square plus k2 square plus l2 square. So, this is what we will uh, uh, we will get and this is cos cos of the angle between uh, so this is cos theta equals this right. So, now I have those two quantities there. So, if I just do this uh, h1 square plus k1 square plus l1 square, square root of that is simply 1. So, square root of 1 square plus 0 square plus 0 square, that is square root of 0 square plus 0 square plus 1 square, both are square root 1. So, I essentially have uh, 0 plus 0 plus 0 square root of 1 into square root of 1 equals 0. Therefore, the angle between those two vectors is 90 degrees. So, cos theta is 0, so therefore, theta is 90 degrees. So, therefore, I can set something as the origin and I will just draw you know, uh, so basically the, uh, the first point that is that I put down here, I can declare as uh, let us say I declare this as 1 0 0. So, I will call this 0 0 0, this is 1 0 0 and so, this vector 0 0 0 to 1 0 0, the uh, uh, other vector has to be 90 degrees to this. So, I will just take a perpendicular point here, a direction perpendicular to it and I will call this uh, yeah, 1 0, uh, 0 0 1 okay. and now with this I will just draw a 5 by 5 grid and we will just uh, uh, name all the points. So, I will just put here point here, a point here. Okay, 5 by 5 grid, we will just stick to, yeah, we will just stick to 5 by 5 grid. So, the, you have uh, these two points here. So, we will just do that. So, square grid of 5 by 5 points. Okay, so, I have a 5 by 5 square grid uh, just drawn on the board. We will just name the points. So, we have uh, two points already identified here uh, 1 0 0 0 0 1. So, we can just name the other point. So, this would be a vectorial addition of these two. So, this is 1 0 1 right and this is uh, I, I move two, st uh, two st uh, steps in this direction. So, this is 2 0 0, this is bar 1 0 0, this is bar 2 0 0. Similarly, this is 0 0 2 this is uh, uh, 0 0 bar 1 in the negative direction, 0 0 bar 2, then we can name the, all the other points. So, this is 1 0 1 bar, this is 2 0 1 bar, so this is uh, uh, 1 0 2 bar and uh, 2 0 2 bar. So, we can continue this. So, this is uh, um, 1 on the, uh, uh, so this is 2 on the x, x direction, so 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, this is uh, uh, 1 along this direction, but 2 along those, that direction, so this is uh, uh, 1, 0, 2, okay. So, uh, similarly this would be bar 1, 0, uh, 1, this is bar 1, 0, 2, this is uh, bar 2, 0, 1, 
bar 2 0 2 ok and uh, we will finish these 4 points here. So, this is uh, bar 1 0 bar 1 this is uh, bar 2 0 bar 1 this is bar bar 2 0 bar 2 and uh, bar 1 0 uh, bar 2 yes. So, that is what we have ok. So, uh, the uh, uh, first number that you get uh, will be the uh, uh, extent to which we are moving in this uh, x direction. So, minus 1 minus, uh, so this is all minus 1, this is all minus 2 and this is all 1, this is all 2 and the last number that you get is the extent to which we are moving in the up and down direction. So, uh, uh, all these numbers end with 1, all these numbers end with 2, all these numbers end with bar 1, all these numbers end with bar 2. So, this is how we have got the uh, set of points. So, these are all the points. Uh, please remember these are all the points without any further restriction, uh, all the points without any restrictions on h, k and l. I have not put uh, except that they all they, they are all the points that correspond to that zone ok. So, they all belong to this zone. Uh, so, zone axis for all these points is 0, 1, 2, 0. So, that is the only restriction that is there on. So, I have taken a cubic lattice and identified all the planes that belong uh, for whom this is the zone axis and I have plotted them in uh, reciprocal space. And please remember that uh, uh, the only th only thing that I have not the, uh, the directions are correct. The only thing that I have not specifically put a value to is the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the length of that uh, spacing. So, just for our uh, simplicity sake we will assume just so that the numbers are convenient for us, but it, it does not really, we will say that you know it was uh, the interplanar spacing there was uh, let us say it was 2 angstroms that is the uh, example that we used there uh, I think yeah, yeah 2 angstroms is what we used. So, therefore, all of this is 0 0.5 angstrom inverse 0 0.5 angstrom inverse. So, that is all it is. So, we have got the dimension also is now correct and the direction is correct because this is this is supposed to be 90 degrees we found two directions we found uh, 1 0 0 0 0 1 and we said that they are, we found that the actual angle between them is 90 degrees and therefore, uh, we went ahead and built up this entire uh, system. So, right. So, we have got all the points that belong to this zone and uh, the dimensions are correct the directions are correct. So, therefore, this is the set of points which are likely to be which are the points basically that are on this line here. This is a line here in reality this should have been a plane and that is why the same plane I have now turned around and I am showing you that plane there. So, this is the plane that is like this, this plane that is on this coming out of the face of the board going into the face of the board that same plane I have put it flat on the board and that is what you see there that is the set of points you see there. So, corresponding to that diagram your beam direction is perpendicular to this board. So, the beam is falling on the sample like this and those are all the points that are possible right. Uh, there you had the uh, 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 the beam coming from beam is coming from here and that is the plane beam is coming from here that is the plane I have just turned it around beam is coming from here this is the plane and that is what you see there. So, that is the thing that you see. Now, additionally I told you that uh, our uh, so we have satisfied several things here uh, if you go back to our question here we said electron diffraction. So, wavelength is very small therefore, the inverse of the wavelength the wave vector is very large. Uh, we found out the zone axis, we understood the meaning of the zone axis and therefore, we, we were able to identify all those points uh, that belong to that zone axis and we also found out that when diffraction occurs using electron diffraction, the points that you see are all the points that correspond to the zone axis. So, those points lie along this line, those are all perpendicular to the uh, beam that is coming in. So, that also we have done. So, all these uh, parameters we have taken into account. Only thing we have not yet accounted for is the fact that it is a phase centered cubic uh, lattice, right. So, for, for that phase centered cubic lattice, the additional condition that I told you is here. In the case of a phase centered cubic lattice, you for diffraction to occur in addition to the fact that those planes have to belong to that zone when you are using electron diffraction, in addition to that, that condition, we want h, k and l to be either all odd or all even, right. So, now, uh, in our case, uh, we are forced to look at only all even because we have got k equal to 0 that is the condition that we got for the planes to be in that zone. So, since k is forced to be 0 and so it is 0 in all the points that we have identified, uh, we are forced to look at only the condition that all even 
is what is going to get permitted for this particular combination of beam direction and sample. Some other combination you could have got all odd also. So, in this particular case because the beam direction is like that you have k equal to 0 and therefore, we are only looking at all even uh, uh, points. So, what are all those all even points? We can just see here. So, this is uh, 1 odd 2 even. So, it is not going to give you a diffraction spot. This is all uh, even. So, this will give you a diffraction spot. So, I will just circle it. So, that is going to give you a diffraction spot. Similarly, if you come here all even is here, this will give you a diffraction spot, this will give you a diffraction spot, diffraction spot, diffraction spot, this one here, this one here and this one here. So, you now suddenly see that out of that uh, you know full set of points that a cubic lattice would have given you a specific subset is what the face centered cubic lattice will give you. Okay? So, this collection of points, this layout of points that you are seeing here, if you take that layout of points, that will be the diffraction pattern that you will see uh, when you do uh, the diffraction of a face centered cubic uh, crystal with uh, the beam aligned such that it is lining up with the 0, 1 bar 0 direction. So, this is what you see as your diffraction pattern and this is how it relates to what uh, all the things that we have discussed uh, in terms of reciprocal space and so on. So, the reciprocal lattice points that you generate are directly related to the diffraction pattern that you see and that is what we have uh, shown uh, I have shown you today. Uh, and uh, so, th this is what happens the only additional detail that we have not put into this uh, is the uh, scaling I have put the actual value here of uh, 0.5 angstrom inverse, but as you can imagine. Uh, any diagram you draw, you can simply you know magnify this or uh, it is it is a scale that you draw. So, I right now you know let us say this is uh, uh, let us say this is uh, 4 inches across. I have simply on this board I have said 4 inches equal to uh, 0.5 angstrom inverse. You can simply say 2 inches equal to 0.5 angstrom inverse in which case the whole thing would shrink a bit or you can expand it a bit. So, that is like any other you know you are magnifying or uh, uh, decreasing the magnification kind of thing. In the context of diffraction pattern we talk of it as camera length, you can change the camera length and that changes the extent to which these points spread out or come closer together, but the layout of points, the angular layout of points would be exactly the same. Okay? And the, uh, the, the pattern that you would see would look exactly the same. Right? So, uh, this is how it relates. So, this is a uh, example that I wanted to work you through. So, anytime you are given a particular lattice and you are given the beam direction uh, as something that coincides with the uh, zone axis, a particular zone. Uh, it becomes the uh, equivalent of a zone axis in that particular crystal, it lines up with the zone axis uh, in that crystal, then corresponding to that you can generate the uh, diffraction pattern. The steps that would be involved are of course, uh, first of all as uh, just to summarize here, the steps that are involved is using the fact that the beam is coming along a particular zone axis, you identify, so that is u v w, if you if any particular h k l has to belong to this, what would be the condition that would be required mathematically, it, this is the condition that has to be satisfied. So, given you have a particular value of uh, zone axis, uh, you have to figure out what are the restrictions on HKL for it to belong to that zone. Okay? So, for example, I could pick another uh, uh, example where let us say I am looking at, uh, I will give you another value here, uh, which would be uh, let us say the 1 1 uh, 1 direction. So, su supposing you had a 1 1 1 direction, uh, then you would require uh, you know um, uh, basically a particular value of HK and L uh, such that uh, the values uh, work out to be uh, 0. So, if you have, um, so for a 1 1 1 direction for example, uh, if, if you were looking at 1 1 1 direction. So, the two planes that would then, uh, two nearby planes that would satisfy this would be a bar 1 0 1 and a, uh, 0 bar 1 1. These two planes if you put uh, in this uh, zone axis you will get, uh, you will be able to satisfy a 0. So, the first thing is you figure out at least two planes which belong to the zone axis, which are the nearest set of planes that you can think of, the smallest uh, indices planes that you can think of uh, that would uh, satisfy this uh, condition for that particular, uh, uh, particular zone axis. Then you also it is important to figure out what is the angle between those two planes. In our case it conveniently turned out to be uh, 90 degrees, so that is why you have a square layout of points there. Uh, if in, in this particular case for example, it will not turn out to be 90 degrees. So, if you actually did this formula for it, so h1, h2 would be 0, k1, k2 would be 0 and l1, l2 would be 1. So, you would have 1 and so this is cos theta and the square root of uh, h square plus k square plus h square would be square root 2, square root of h square plus k square plus l square would be again square root 2. So, this would be root 2 
times uh, root 2. So, this is 1 by 2. So, theta is actually 60 degrees, cos 60 is half. Okay. So, if I had this as the zone axis, uh, the two planes that I would pick would be these two which would be very close. From experience you can pick the lowest indices planes that would satisfy this condition of belonging to this zone and they, they would belong to this zone because they would satisfy this uh, equation. Uh, and then I also need to know the angle between them. So, I should instead of drawing a square set of planes uh, points that I have drawn here, I would set something as the origin, I would set something as uh, the uh, uh, 1 bar 0 1 and then at 60 degrees to it, I would set the other one 0 1 bar 1. So, those two I would set at 60 degrees. So, this would be twisted 60 degrees. Then I would generate all the points. After having generated all the points, I would then look at this uh, additional condition, the extinction condition, which is whether they are all odd or all even and then generate all of these points. Uh, the subset, identify that subset which then satisfies the uh, all the conditions required in that problem. Okay. So, this is a, a nice worked example that I thought I should share with you, which shows you how you go from a, a reciprocal lattice calculation to a diffraction pattern uh, that you would actually see, observe in under an electron microscope. So, next time you see a diffraction pattern, you need not be worried. You can relate to a lot of the things that we have discussed in our class and it will easily tell you uh, how they relate to each other. Uh, the in, in all this discussion, there is one other point that I thought I, it would be interesting for you to keep uh, keep in mind uh, and that is simply that you know when you talk of real space and reciprocal space, uh, any quantity that is large in real space becomes very small in reciprocal space uh, and vice versa. So, that you have already seen, I mean so a very small uh, wavelength becomes a very large wave vector uh, and uh, correspondingly you know large relatively larger uh, interatomic uh, spacings become a relatively smaller quantities in reciprocal space. So, uh, what you see here is actually a slice in reciprocal space uh, that you are uh, of points uh, and these are points now because we are talking of a large single crystal where the dimensions are all large in all dimensions. Uh, supposing instead of a single crystal, large single crystal you had a thin film. So, by definition a thin film is very small in one dimension, it is very large in two dimensions. right? So, corresponding to it uh, the uh, uh, intensity that you will see in if you are talking in terms of intensity of a spot in the uh, uh, in the reciprocal space, it be, it actually becomes a rod. So, uh, where it is in uh, large in two dimensions, it becomes small in that dimension in reciprocal space, another small thing in a reciprocal space, where it is thin, it becomes a long rod. Okay. So, that is something that you can at least keep in mind, uh, you do not have to immediately, I mean to do this you do not immediately need it, but just for you to you know re really relate the thing that you see in the uh, uh, electron microscope to what you draw here, when you see variations in intensity and so on. Uh, those are some of the parameters that impact the variation in intensity. And also you are taking a slice, so exactly where it slices through reciprocal space will give you, that is why when you tilt the sample a little bit this way, that way you will start seeing changes in intensity and so on. Uh, and those are all the things that uh, impact the intensity. Okay. So, we will not get into that detail too much, but uh, this is how uh, what you have, uh, all the things that you have discussed uh, relate to uh, what you have, uh, what you will actually see in an experiment. One other point that we should also note is that uh, the origin, the choice of origin is uh, arbitrary. So, in fact, the origin is also a point that would satisfy all of our conditions, uh, which is that uh, the HK and L uh, are all uh, even for our uh, particular uh, uh, problem, because you have the 0, 0, uh, 2 bar point here, this could have been chosen as the origin, then that would have been uh, satisfied as uh, the corresponding point. So, this then would be the final layout if you looked at the uh, FCC with that being the zone axis. So, with this we will halt today and uh, we will see in some other class. Thank you.